Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracy's The Populist Dialogues. Our program promotes progressive populist perspectives on the issues of the day. The Alliance for Democracy is dedicated to establishing true democracy and creating a just society based on an equitable, sustainable economy. Our guest today is Helen Patty Hill, who, in addition to being a playwright, painter, illustrator, and teacher, is also author of A Brief History of Fear and Intolerance in Tillamook County. So, welcome to the show. Thank and you here's so a, much, here's David. Here's a picture of the, uh, of the book cover. All yep. right, there we go. All right, so uh, thank you very much for being here, Helen. David, um, it's my honor and I'm delighted. Yeah, yeah. well I, uh, as I said while we were sitting here chatting, this is one of the best books that I have read in a very long time. Thank you. Uh, both because of the way it's written and because of the topic uh, and because it's local history. Yes, it is local. Right. Yeah, so, uh, the point. So, I, so I will do a plug for this book right off the bat. Best book, bar none, that I've read for the past couple of years, and I hope that all of our watchers will go and buy it. So there's the advertisement. Well, thank you, and it's really not about me or the book. It's really about the subject matter, which I'm pretty passionate about. Uh, right. You know, so fear, yeah. fear and intolerance in Tillamook County. So we have we have viewers uh, across the nation. So tell people where Tillamook County is. Tillamook County is a very um, rugged, gorgeous, beautiful county on the coast, just due west of Portland. Mm -hmm. It's um, mostly dairy and timber industry, and it's. Um, it's a beautiful place, full of full of very rugged pioneer spirits. Oh yes, oh, right, yeah. yeah. And, and uh, about how many people live there? Oh boy, I'm not good with numbers. It's in the first chapter. Uh, um, yeah, I, I, um, I'm recalling something like 25. Thank you. 25,000 sounds, 25, sounds right. right. They okay. say there's actually more cows, more dairy cows than people. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, and of course the uh, famous Tillamook. Uh, uh, Cheese factory is yes, there. Yes, absolutely. Right, right. Which is sold worldwide. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, uh, how did you um, decide to write about Tillamook County? Well, I um, came there when I was pregnant with my first child, and I was so struck by the beauty of the place and the people and all of it. And I wanted to raise my children in a place with clean air and good community. And um, that's where I settled for the next 30, 40 years. Mm -hmm. So okay. I raised my children there. And so you have deep roots there. Yes. My yeah. children are native Tillamookians at this uh -huh. point. Tillamookians. Yeah. Okay. Sure, that's, Something like that's that. the correct term. But. <laughs> okay. Right. Yeah. And um, you lived there for that period of time and you started learning this history. Yes, um, I, um, it, it really came about as a result of a friend of mine, Julianne Johnson, who was a substitute teacher in the area high school. And while she was there, she saw many instances of bullying and racial uh, bullying among the students. And in fact, there was a trash can in the back of the school, an incinerator that had Jew burner spray painted on it. And the administration didn't do anything about it for some months. And she was pretty horrified by this. And she decided in her beautiful proactive way to bring the Anne Frank exhibit to Tillamook County, the actual mm -hmm. traveling exhibit that's gone all over the world. And I wrote um, a small pamphlet to coincide with that uh, exhibit, and that was in 97, I believe, 20 years ago. And it was um, a stunner to me as I started to go down this rabbit hole to find out how strong the Ku Klux Klan was, what happened to the native people, why there are not no black people and no people uh, from the native tribes in the county, or, or very, very few. So it was an eye-opener for me, and the pamphlet then gradually expanded over the years into the full-blown book. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. And, and, and when did the book get published? It was just published last, uh, not this spring, but a year ago, okay. before we had uh, Donald Trump is a verified candidate. I was almost thinking that maybe it was becoming an irrelevant issue, which shows what a bubble I'm in, first of all. And second of all, um, the, you know, the landslide of racism and white supremacy that we're dealing with now, I didn't see that coming. Um, mm -hmm. And I actually, if there's anything good that can come of the Trump administration, I do think it's that there's a big spotlight shining on 
these groups around the country and the systemic institutionalized racism that is very alive and well in this country. Mm -hmm. It's okay. coming out like pus out of a wound right now. So. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's unfortunately a good description of a pus out of a wound. Yeah, but yeah. that's what has to happen before uh -huh. you can fully clean the wound, I think. Y yes, so. uh, right, yeah. Yeah, and, and you talk in, in the book about the Oregon Citizens Alliance. Yes. Uh, talk, talk about that just for, just for a second. Um, yeah, that was back in 2000, I believe, and that was a ballot measure that was going to basically take rights away from gay people and um, basically categorize them as second-class citizens who couldn't own property. And um, it was a very contentious ballot measure, and um, it thankfully was voted down. Mm -hmm. But it was pretty pretty powerful in many parts of rural Oregon, it was it was voted in. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, 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 but but uh, statewide it, it was defeated. Yes. So that was that was a, 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 yes. a good thing. But we have these cycles of fear and intolerance mm -hmm. that move through, and uh, I write in the book about um, uh, an incident not too long ago where um, there were um, a couple of men that were holding up signs against you know homosex is sin on the corners of Tillamook and one young very brave high school girl who stood out there made a sign on the spot saying I love gays and the amount of um, people that came to her to support her and stand with her until 10 or 11 o'clock that night mm -hmm. was very heartwarming and it started a movement called Tillamook for love so there's a lot of wonderful things oh. happening in Tillamook County and um, but there's yeah there's still a lot there's of still that embedded right yeah and, I, I, and I, yeah my feeling is is that and, and it all depends on what circles you 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 run in but my my feeling is that uh, we live in a very tolerant uh, society uh, and world and then it kind of comes as a shock to me yeah. when we see these things yeah we uh, live in a bubble I think and um, those of us who have white privilege and I, f I feel like racism and intolerance is one of the worst worms that goes into the human psyche and it's responsible for so many horrific events such as uh, the Holocaust ethnic cleansing the slave trade all of that and it's it's something that we've just got to get over as a human race, mm -hmm. and I don't know how to do that. Write a book, march in the streets, do whatever it takes, speak of it. Don't let any bad jokes go un, you know, unchallenged. unchallenged mm -hmm. Whatever it takes. Um, so this book is actually my effort to bring local education to, uh, excuse me, to students of the county, and I'm hoping that that's how it can be used. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah. So this really is. Uh, not only a brief history, it's also a hidden history. Yes, it's, it's hidden in plain sight. Yeah, and I, I'm a native Portlander, a native Oregonian, yeah. and most of the history that's in this book I had a little inkling of, but you've put uh, some, some flesh on the bones yeah, uh, I, that's I, really needed. So talk about, you start the book talking about the Native Americans yes. and the coming of the white man. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. Talk, talk a little bit about that. Uh, because uh, the people who had been here before the white men arrived have been here for over 10,000 yes, years. Yes, they have been. So they had a rich cultural they history. Did. They did. And um, sadly, it's, it's the same story as throughout much of the country, you know, with, with the gradual arrival of the white man. You know, there was disease, there was um, genocidal practices such as sterilization, taking the young children away from their homes and cutting their hair and forbidding them to speak the native tongue. So there were many things happening like that and um, Tillamook County was not exempt and I tell the story of what happened to the Tillamook tribe which is a really sad story you know there were all those things came into play sterilization all those sorts of things and I by the way everything is cited and footnoted mm -hmm. to the best of my I mean deeply deeply the footnotes are extensive and the resources as well are listed because I want this to be not a book that, that someone can say oh well who really knows if that's true or not it's not hearsay it's it's you know there's lots of sources cited mm -hmm. all through and um, um, yeah there are really no Tillamook people left with you know that and the Tillamook tribe was a, a gorgeous tribe they were actually a splinter of the Coast Salish 
who were further up the coast, and they were the ones who made those beautiful canoes and the totem poles, and they were artisans of the highest order. Mm -hmm. And they you know, probably came down the coast in one of their beautiful cedar canoes and found a beautiful stand of cedar there in Tillamook County at the Hoquarton, it's called now. And that's why local history is so important, because you can actually take students out and say, you know, right to the right of the highway here, can you imagine a huge village, uh, even bigger than Tillamook is today, mm -hmm. full of people um, gathering berries and, and harvesting and, and teaching each other and uh, medicine and all the things that make a culture vibrant. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that's gone. But our place names remain and remind us. And I feel like there's a kind of violence embedded in the very soil when the ways that those people disappeared aren't being reckoned with and aren't being, um, uh, they, they're not known. And I think it's very important. I, I speak in the book about the statue of Robert Gray, the yes. piece of public mm -hmm. art that I find extremely offensive. I'm not a Native American, um, but if I was, I think I would feel nauseous passing mm -hmm. by that statue up and down Highway 101. It's right there in Garibaldi. And uh, since we're talking about monuments mm -hmm. as a nation right now, Robert Gray was, he's, stan he's, he's depicted standing on top of a sacred shaman's bentwood box, which was the repository for some of their most sacred ritual objects. And he's got this kind of victorious way of standing there. And Robert Gray was a slave trader. He was one of the most feared uh, men. He, um, he obliterated um, a couple of villages up in the Nootka Sound because he didn't like the way they were treating him. He had a reputation for killing. Um, just whimsically for those os otter, sea otter pelts. He was a capitalist and he was there to pillage. Mm -hmm. And um, in fact, um, in 2005, descendants of Robert Gray made a public apology mm -hmm. to the tribe that he had so harmed in the Nootka Sound. But when he arrived on the scene in the Lady Washington there in Tillamook Bay, they were very afraid of him. There was a grapevine all up and down the coast mm -hmm. that warned of his coming. and. Uh, they were met with uh, wariness and trouble broke out and they called it Murderer's Harbor for, for many years. Now it's Tillamook Bay. Mm -hmm. But, you know, to drive by this statue every day of this man who um, was, before he came out to do the, the sea otter pelts, he was part of the triangular trade, which is the slave trade, mm -hmm. which is where ships would leave South Carolina, wherever, go to Europe with trade goods. Uh, then go to Africa with more trade goods and bring back shipfuls of slaves. So, and the fur trade and the slave trade were very, yeah, uh, yeah, very it's entwined. Like, it's like we talk about globalization now, but globalization is not really new, because certainly no. it, it was globalization yeah. worked then. Yes, uh, and, right. and perhaps he did discover the Columbia River, even though there were tribes living there for millennia, yes. uh -huh, right. and he did name it the Columbia, and, uh, but he wasn't a, an explorer, he was, he was out to uh, make, he was make an a exploiter. good pilot. He was an exploiter. He was an exploiter, not an explorer. Yeah. And he hunted <laughs> the sea otter to local mm -hmm. extinction there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, right, yeah. So, uh, any, uh, any movement that you're aware of to remove that monument? No, no, it's a, it's a sore topic. I actually mm -hmm. um, had a talk with the artist when it first appeared in 2001. I, I oh, found so out who it was. I, oh, okay. 2001, I called him up. I said, wow, you know, the way he's standing on top of that sacred tribal box it's mm -hmm. it's it, how why did you do that why did you put him up there like that and he said well I was trying to show that him on the prow of a boat you know how you stand like uh -huh. this to keep your yeah. balance I'm like, yeah, well, okay but he's not then. he's not on a prow of a boat he's, <laughs> yeah. he's so and then he said well that box was to symbolize the kind of foundation of the world that he had come to but I, I feel like maybe it was an innocent mistake on his part but it's a powerful mm -hmm. powerful message that mm -hmm. when you look at it yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, and and, it, and, those, and, and even even if even if his foot wasn't on this on this box, yeah, that he would be honored, is um, yeah, is, um, yeah. Since we're rethinking some of these Robert E. Lee and all mm -hmm. that, you know, right. I, there's yeah. there are yeah. some extraordinary people yeah. from the county. But yeah. So um, beyond those, uh, the native tribes and that history. Yes. Um, what other groups do you talk about in the book? Um, well, the Ku Klux Klan was hugely 
um, active, as it was in very many counties throughout Oregon. Uh, Tillamook wasn't by any chance, by any means, alone. But what makes Tillamook County kind of different and very interesting to study is that somehow, someone was able to um, get some documents, some membership roles and, and, and minutes and all the, the flyers and the paraphernalia that they would recruit with. Um, they got that out of the county and into the Special Collections Library in Eugene. So anyone can actually put on the white gloves and go there and look through these things. Oh. And I was able to recreate um, back in the 20s what what the clan was like because you know I could I could go through the microfiche of the Tillamook Headlight and the Tillamook Herald. They've now been combined as the Headlight Herald and see all of the different elected officials and compare that with the membership roles that I found in Eugene. I found 16 out of 17 elected officials were dues paying members mm. of the Klan including the editor, editors of the newspapers, judges, mayors, police chiefs, everybody but the dog catcher maybe or maybe including the dog catcher. <laughs> so you have a town um, that's very isolated um, through its geography. You have the coast range running through and I talk a lot about how the county was influenced by that isolation for many years, and still is to some extent. It's a very um, daunting geographical barrier. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of things went on there that, that didn't reach the light of day, um, except for one incident, which was the branding of a woman named Nevada Standish, and that did make it to the Portland papers, and Tillamook had to take a good look at itself during that period. Mm -hmm. Okay, talk about that branding. Well, it's kind of shrouded in mystery. She turns up on the front page of the Oregonian because her husband was in a hospital in, in Portland and she came to visit him with a high neck collar which she didn't usually wear and he asked her what's going on and she showed him this this inflamed cross that had been burnt into her breast and um, she was a white woman um, um, it's kind of lost to history why they went after her but she identified the men as the chief of police and they were wearing hooded you know uh, clan paraphernalia and the clan uh, they wear a cross across their mm -hmm. breast, um, which over their heart, you know, when, and when you think of the Christian um, symbolism that they used, it's, it's horrific. You know, Christianity as I know it is, is a gorgeous religion, you know, that has nothing to do with the Klan mm -hmm. morals and ethics. Uh, it's a bit like ISIS and uh, the Muslim. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. So um, it, it got exposed through the Portland papers and then the because Tillamook was at the point of really needing some federal funds and some state funds to do some infrastructure. They really put this story down, and I write about it in the book, and um, it's a very interesting tale. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, all right, I, I, I thought it was. Um, um, why, when there are no black people, essentially, almost no black people in Tillamook County, was the Ku Klux Klan such a power? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, uh, status quo, there weren't any black people, they wanted to keep it that way. Also, the Klan was really galvanized around the Catholic issue back then, the Catholic school bill. Oregon was seen um, nationally as one of the most um, prejudiced places um, in America during that Catholic school bill. That was a bill that the Klan was pushing forward using Oregon as a test territory to basically mandate that all children were educated in the public school and ending all of the Catholic schools. They were, they felt very ironically that the um, Catholics were aliens because they had this uh, alien arcane language, Latin. They used their own arcane language, <laughs> yeah, you know. That's why they, I chuckled. Um, <laughs> exalted Cyclops and uh, all yeah, of that. Right. And they, they felt very threatened by any one alien, be they Italian American, German American. Uh, Catholic. So, yeah, so all those groups that are now integrated and assimilated were seen as aliens at the time. Yes, mm -hmm. and a threat to the American way of life. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing that cycle yeah. again. I would assume that there were probably um, a sizable population of Chinese. Um, they got pretty run out of town after they built the railroads, and they were, there were millions of Chinese. Oh, thousands, not millions. Yeah in the Oregon coast from Astoria all the way down the coast and they were helping in the service industries, uh, helping to gut the fish and and uh, build the railroads. They came um, to America looking for a better life and money to be able to send back home but they there was there were a couple of laws I'm not fresh on when they happened that mm -hmm. that limited uh, so 
um, Tillamook actually advertised that there were no Chinese in the back of one of their um, oh. um, pamphlets that they uh -huh. they gave out for tourism. So mm. they they've been run out. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I uh, the other thing which surprised me, and um, this just reveals my lack of knowledge more than anything else probably, is that I didn't realize that there was a, a women's auxiliary to the Ku Klux Klan. Yes, they call them the Lotties, the, the Lotties. Ladies of the Invisible Empire. The Invisible Empire is another word for the Ku Klux Klan. They were very active. I, and, and a lot of people like to say, well, because there were no blacks, the Ku Klux Klan was just a benevolent men and women's business organization, you know, for networking and doing good. You know, they, they would give uh, monetary donations to the library and this and that. But the Nevada Standish story really kind of gives light of that. Mm -hmm. um, it was a little bit of a wild west. And they were very involved, I believe, in the whiskey trade, the illegal whiskey trade. This during Prohibition. Could have been Nevada was a bit of a bootlegger and they were targeting her because of that. That's one theory. But um, because the, the theory would be that the Ku Klux Klan itself was trying to monopolize the bootleg exactly, trade. Exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. And they were brought in, um, basically they sold them to, to folks as you know a law and order to help with law and order because you had, um, you had a lot of things happening in the early 1900s. You had the advent of a car, which was really scary for people. You mm -hmm. know, all of a sudden from these quiet horse-drawn carriages you had 1950, 1920, it came to Tillamook a little later, you had these belching, speeding, infernal combustion engines running around, and you had radio, which was like, oh, you know, voices yeah. in the air, and you had women trying to vote, and you had all this <laughs> crazy stuff happening, and I think everyone felt things were spinning out of control. So they welcomed the Klan to help with law and order, and the Wobblies, oh, they hated the Wobblies. They yeah. actually sent out groups of, of um, Tillamook uh, men to shoot and kill for the crime of carrying a, um, a wobbly card. And they were going into the mills simply to try to organize because it, it was horrific conditions for the workers there. Mm -hmm. the runaway profits of the lumber companies were not filtering down to the people that were actually doing the hard work. That's a familiar story, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. On all, all, too, all too current, too. Yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. Um, What's the, what's the effect of having hidden history, about not knowing our history? It's just such a good question, and I, I feel like some of that violence is still embedded in the soil, and it's, it's almost like what's the effect on a human being to not know their history? Mm -hmm. Ed, it's, it's a little bit, I was a chief petitioner for a ballot measure to, to get adult adoptees their original birth certificates back in two, 1998, and in a way it's some of the same um, idea that if if you don't meet your history, if you don't know your history, it continues to subtly influence, and um, we can see that in so many ways. There are no black families that have there. There are very few in Tillamook. There's there's some coming, and but often um, I was there's there's a young man that I was um, at a book reading with, and he he was black and gay. And his story of what happened to him as a lone black gay man and a young student in Tillamook High was, it was horrific. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, people spitting on his locker, inviting him to a party only to find they were there to beat him up when he got there. Mm -hmm. uh, he had to be really strong. And he's come out and he's talked about it quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And there's stories like that that are still around. And yeah. I'd love to see this county that I love with all my heart come mm -hmm. out of this era and face its past. and welcome families of any color and any yeah. religion right. and yeah. any sexual pers Good. persuasion. Uh, so with, with just a minute or so left, yeah. how do you hope this book will be used? I really hope that it will be used by students um, because we teach national and world history in our schools. Our curriculums don't include local history. And when you can point to the fairground, say, and say, you know, this that's where the airplane that was carrying a flaming cross crashed during the showing of The Birth of the Nation, which was a horrific racist movie back mm -hmm. in the 20s. That's where that happened, right where the demolition derby happens now. And, and that's Stillwell Avenue, where the, police, uh, the chief of police threw sticks at Nevada Standish's door to, to threaten her. Um, and that, there's where the Hoquarton was, where the cedar trees used to be. That's so rich and it's so meaningful and relevant. Mm -hmm. I mean, Washington crossing the Delaware is very interesting and all, but it, it doesn't have that, that, that juice and that relevance of mm -hmm. living 
right where the history is, right. is yeah. happened. Right. Yeah. Well, I, I have one more question. It, yeah. It's kind of complicated, but we really do only have a minute left. Okay. But I'll ask it anyway. How did uh, the PR effort to gain support for the First World War affect fear and intolerance in Tillamook County? That's a in great a question. <laughs> yeah, well, that was kind of, you saw the birth of the first propaganda machine happen when they were trying to sell a war in a way far away place. That, who wants to send their sons to die in a war they don't understand? So they, they generated this propaganda machine um, to talk about how awful the German, you know, just posters of horrific guerrilla looking brutes with German helmets on. And, and they really inculcated fear and intolerance of all things alien in order for people to want to rise to the the call and send their their beautiful young men to die in a war thousands of miles away so it's it's uh yeah the propaganda and mm -hmm. that they used to sell the war kind of settled in as fear yeah and so that in turn would probably set the uh the um uh, medium if you will for the ku klux klan to develop yeah, I right. think so. And I, if I just have one second, I'd like to say I'm so passionate about this issue. And anyway, anybody can work to to fight racism and tolerance, be it write a book, march in the streets, do art, poetry, music, um, whatever you can do. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's time. Yeah, it's time it's for time. us to do it. Right. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, David. Yeah. This has All been right. really, really wonderful. Yeah. Thank yeah. you so Great. much. Good. So we've been talking with Helen Patty Hill, author of A Brief History of Fear and Intolerance in Tillamook County. Helen concludes her book with this statement. History is a moving train. We are all riding. There are no bystanders. Everything we do, say, buy, and think will shape the times to come. Last November, voters in Multnomah County approved limits on campaign contributions with an approval rate of almost 90%. In the measure was a requirement that the county commission adopt further rules to implement some sections, and a deadline for doing so was established, September 1, 2017. September 1st has come and gone, and no implementation rules have been established. We are assured that all the commissioners support limiting campaign contributions and getting big special interest money out of our elections. If they do, then they need to follow the requirements of our voter approved measure and adopt implementing rules now. Please contact Multnomah County Commissioners and let them know you support limits on campaign contributions as well as disclosure of who is actually giving on the political ads themselves and that you expect the commissioners to adopt the rules. Phone them at 503-988-5213. Thank you for watching. I hope we'll see you again next week. Bye.